Hello and welcome to Iowa Sports Talk on the Hawkeye Network. I'm Kyle Hughes alongside Matt Jansen. Today we are going to talk some Hawkeye basketball with Iowa forward Melson Masabi. And we're also going to talk a little pigskin with HawkeyeDrive.com reporter Brendan Stiles. But first, we're going to cover some of the Hawkeye headlines. Matt, some of the latest news to come out. Iowa's non-conference basketball schedule still really starting to ratchet up. Uh, announced that they're going to be taking on Notre Dame, the Fighting Irish, in the ACC Big Ten Challenge. Yeah, it's great. I'm sure Fran's excited about it. You know, a team that he actually coached for was an assistant. 11 years. 11 yeah. years. I mean, he, it's, I think if you can pick that, you almost forget, oh, Notre Dame's in the ACC now. <laughs> well, they're not yet. July yeah. 1st, yeah, move over there. Um, if you can pick a team, you know, a marquee matchup, obviously there's the Dukes and North Carolinas, but Notre Dame, that's going to be a fun matchup that we, you know, haven't, you know, haven't had for a while at Carver Hawkeye Arena. 1950, last yeah. time that they've been <laughs> yeah, there. A few years. Yeah, I mean, they haven't even played them that much in the past, but... I mean, I, I, we were there, obviously. Yeah, oh, game. yeah. I age incredibly well the makeup <laughs> that we have, uh, the budget for that. It's, it's like the Lord of the Rings. It's like 90% of exactly. the budget. Exactly, yeah. Like they dress me up really well. <laughs> uh, but last year, 313th out of 347 in the strength schedule. They get Notre Dame at home. Now they have also added the uh, Battle for Atlantis tournament. Uh, so they're going to be taking on some really good programs there. A uh, list of some of the teams in there, Kansas, Villanova, Tennessee, Xavier, UTEP, uh, Wake Forest, and USC, Kansas, and Villanova, both tournament teams last year. They're guaranteed to play at least three of those teams. Well, three of those teams they will play yeah. in, in that tournament. So. Strength of schedule already looking a lot better this year. Yeah, obviously it's something that they needed to address. Um, they obviously did really fast. They match you up in the ACC Big yeah, Ten that's tournament. True. They you try and match you up with someone teams. who they feel is around, you know, the same caliber. Uh, that hasn't worked out for Iowa. The last time they've won in the Big Ten ACC tournament it was 05. Uh, Steve Alford yeah, was North the Carolina last State. Time, yeah, last time they won one of those games, but. They get Notre Dame in Carver Hawkeye Arena. The team's looking up next year, and uh, a lot of people are excited about it. Some Some people have the Hawkeyes a preseason top 25 team, uh, and they can make a some noise before the Big Ten starts. If it's obviously a make or break year. I mean, you have a lot of you got a, a lot of seniors on this team, and uh, getting to the NIT championships was, was great. Championship was great for them, but they want to make the NCAA tournament. Devin Absolutely. Marble. Nelson Basabi, you know, I'll let them speak for themselves, but getting to the NIT is not their end goal. They want to go to the NCAA tournament. They want to make some noise. This is a team that getting some pre, gonna, you probably maybe ranked in the preseason top 25, which really at the end of the day doesn't mean anything. Yeah. But it's nice because then other people are seeing that this team could do, you know, go far. And we're going to find out a lot about them when they go to that battle for Atlantis tournament. That's over the Thanksgiving weekend. And they also have to go, uh, at Hilton Coliseum to take on Iowa State, another team that made yeah. the tournament last year. So uh, they've got a much schedule. tougher schedule, and you know the Big Ten schedule is going to be hard as well. So last year we kind of saw the NCAA tournament, the selection committee kind of rewarded teams that played tough teams, even if they lost those games. And I think that really factored into how Iowa made this schedule this year. Um, another thing that will deal with schedules, a little bit on the football side, Big Ten realignment, moving to the West and East divisions, abandoning legends and leaders. Oh, no. Yeah, new fancy names, along with some new fancy schools, Rutgers and Maryland, joining the uh, East. They will be part of that side. West going to be Iowa, along with all of their rivals. How does this alignment factor into the Hawkeyes' future football schedule? Well, I think on the, if you're looking outside looking in, and you could, if you could pick where you want to be, most people will probably say, I want to be in the West. Yeah. Because, you know, you have the obvious powers, the Michigan, the Ohio State, the Penn State, who are normally really good, and they're all in the East. However, you know, some people take jabs and want to say, oh, this looks like the Big 12 North, that when Nebraska was down a few years ago, it wasn't, you know, you had teams exactly. like there were, seven and five you would have playing in the Big 12 championship. A team in the South contending for the national championship, taking on a team in the Big 12 championship from the Big 12 North Usually Nebraska, who's eight and four, seven yeah. and five, not a not a great matchup there. But there's going to be years like that in both divisions. Yeah. I mean, occasionally the East teams are going to beat up on each other. We've seen Michigan go down and Ohio, Ohio State, State have down Penn years. State. Penn State, obviously, they were better they're than still the way going they thought, through a lot. They're better than the way they thought they were going to be. Yeah. But you never know with all the and there will be production. teams in the West that'll come out and have crazy seasons that you don't expect from them. Uh, Wisconsin. Uh, two years ago, people weren't expecting them to be as good as they were. We'll see how they do without Bielema. Yeah. You know, they could, who knows, maybe the new coach takes them where Bielema couldn't and gets a Rose Bowl win. Who knows? I don't know. A lot of people 
weren't so sad to see him go, which I think is crazy because three straight Rose Bowls. Obviously, they didn't win, but we'll see how they could go either way. And yeah. most importantly to Hawkeye fans is they'll get to face Wisconsin and have a chance to get some of those trophies back right now, just uh, one of the four trophies in Kinnick Stadium. Hopefully, we'll have four of four after this season. That'd be nice. Yeah, but we'll, <laughs> we'll have talk to, more, we'll we'll talk have to wait more and see. Football later. Have Brandon yeah. Stiles coming up later. But up next, Iowa basketball forward Melson Basabi. You're watching Iowa Sports Talk on the Hawkeye Network. <laughs> I used to let the mic smoke. Now I slam it when I'm done and make sure it's broke. When I'm gone, no one gets on. Cause I won't let nobody press up and mess up the scene I set. I like to stand in a crowd and watch the people wonder. But think about a thing you understand. I'm just an addict addicted to music. Maybe it's a habit. I ain't no joke. We're here with the real slime time. Melson Basabi joining us here on Iowa Sports Talk. Melson, talk a little bit about that slime time uh, nickname uh, for any fans out there who don't exactly know how know how you got to be known as Slime Time. Uh, slime time is just you know something we say in New York. It means you know my man was up slime was good slime. Just a family and slime really is just you know I brought it with me my freshman year. Uh, it was a rapper named Vado. You know, he's a pretty good rapper. He kind of blew it up. He was saying it on his mixtapes and stuff, and, you know, I heard it, and it was just part of the lingo, so I don't want to take all the credit. So then I brought it out here and yeah. sort of brought it to the basketball world, you know, the slime time, and then it then really it just turned into how much, you know, just the fans and slime time really just became, you know, just my whole people that I'm touching, whether it's the Iowa fans, the people in New York that I know. Uh, everybody I've encountered, everybody that you know supports me, supports the Hawks. Like everybody who loves Iowa, everybody who's in the spirit of Iowa, all of that is Slime Time. It's really just you know a brand of just a camaraderie, so to speak. You talked about coming from New York. Uh, now coming up on your senior year, uh, you kind of followed Fran McCaffrey a little bit. You were. Um, committed to play at Siena where he was coaching and right. then after he left uh, a tough decision but you eventually decided to come join the Hawks uh, it wasn't really a tough decision this is an opportunity in my lifetime you know to be on this big stage big 10 court you know coming from a small place you know I'm from New York I've lived a lot of places but really where I you know where I reside at now is a small place people don't really do a lot of big things so it, it just meant so much to me and it was like a dream come true I'm watching this type of brand of basketball in my life and now I'm a part of it and I still feel the same way I'm still living out you know a dream I asked God for this opportunity so it's a blessing and I feel like you know day to day I just appreciate it I don't get caught up you know, in, in different things and worrying I have in the past. But right now, I just think, you know, this is just, this is fun. I always wanted this, I always ask for this. This is a blessing. So I'm just embracing my teammates. And I'm so happy with the success that we have, you know, and there's a lot of, you know, energy going into next year. But, you know, I appreciate it more because I've seen it build up and grow. So I think the key is to just remain humble myself and as a team. And, you know, remember winning is more important than any individual. Because when you start thinking about yourself, that's when things can go wrong. He talked about uh, he talked about following Fran. Um, the the news that just came out recently is his old team, where he was an assistant coach at Notre Dame. You guys are going to play them in the Big Ten ACC Challenge. That helps uh, bump up your schedule, and also you know playing switching to playing for the Battle for Atlantis. Um, you know we, we talked off camera. You know how last year was great, 25 wins, but in the end, you know really your long term goal is. NCAA tournament. I mean, last year was great. You know, we appreciate the fans selling out the NIT games, and you know, we made a great run to the NIT championship, and we're definitely, you know, appreciative and uh, of the opportunity. And, and to be honest, I think we deserved it because we earned it. The coaching staff, you know, worked tirelessly. The guys worked on their game tirelessly, so we earned we earned everything we got. But you know, it was still, in a sense, disappointing that we didn't get to the tournament because we competed with some of the best teams in the country and went neck to neck and we felt like we were just as good as anybody in that field so I think we need to carry that into next year and just remember those little things that we need to get over the hump and you know I think that could be done but it has to be shown it can't be talked about so 
we just have to, you know, keep working this and see what happens. And Matt brought up the uh, non-conference schedule a little bit. Already a potential to play uh, four teams that made the NCAA tournament last right. year with Iowa State, Notre Dame, potentially Kansas and Villanova. But the Big Ten's going to be really tough as well. Um, I know you guys have to believe that you're a factor for winning the Big Ten championship. But what are what's one of the schools out there that you're really looking at as maybe your primary competition? Um. Really, it's the Big Ten, so every school is competition. There's just no easy nights. Uh, obviously, you know, that's been proven year in and year out. Shoot, when we was a 11 and what, 20 team, we beat the number six team in the country on our, on Jericho's senior day. So, you know, you can't underestimate anybody at this level. In any conference, it's college basketball. People are prepared and people are talented. And, you know, those who know the game know that that, that, that holds true. So I think, you know, the important part is you mentioned the non-conference schedule. It's not just about scheduling. You know, you have to beat them. We, going, we don't just want to say we played them. We want to say we beat them. So I think, you know, that's, that's going to be key is that we need to execute our opportunities. So uh, last question now. Um, we talked a little bit and how uh, your offseason plans. Your, right. your, I actually was there your freshman year or going into your freshman year. I remember shooting you um, for primetime league. And I remember saying, I called my brother, I go, oh, this guy's going to start. Right. <laughs> I just knew you were going to be an impact player right away. Now, you're not going to be in the primetime league, but you're going to do, you know, something you're going to train still, but you're also going to do something to kind of help yourself as a, a student part of the student right. athlete. You want to talk about that? Uh, well, basically, you know, uh, I asked Coach McCaffrey if I can go to New York and I had set up an internship and, you know, some different things just to help me, you know, broaden myself just as a man, just as a as a student and just as a, you know, as a citizen, so to speak, you know, we get caught up in the basketball hype, but, you know, hopefully my, my basketball career can continue. I'm going to, I have trainers in place and I'm going to be working out tirelessly. And, you know, obviously it's a bunch of summer leagues in New York, so I'll be doing basketball all day long, but also, you know, basketball isn't going to be forever. And I want to, you know, I wanted to step away and just do something, you know, for myself. I'm a senior now. I didn't need to go to summer school. My grades wasn't in question. So I just felt like, you know, it's time for me to make a mature decision. And I was grateful that Coach McCaffrey trusted me and let me do it. Well, Melson, it was fantastic having you on today. I uh, welcome anytime. Melson Basabi here on Iowa Sports Talk. We'll be back with more. Thank you. Appreciate that. Welcome back to Iowa Sports Talk. Kyle Hughes, Matt Jansen. We're going to talk a little bit about Hawkeye football here with Brendan Stiles, creator, reporter from HawkeyeDrive.com. Brendan, great to have you on the show. Um, we're going to start things off. The quarterback competition, uh, three, three horse race right there. No one knows who it's going to be. Who do you think? Well, first of all, I appreciate the invite. So thanks for having me on. Um, it is definitely a three horse race. And there's one thing that Kirk Ferentz was saying after their last spring practice, or I guess spring scrimmage, if you will, uh, yeah, this, year. this yeah, past yeah. week or two weeks ago, uh, that it's going to still be basically three guys competing for it into August, into fall camp. Uh, if I had to say there's a favorite right now, it would probably be Jake Rudock. And the reason why I feel that way is just because he's has experience. He's been in the program for two years now, as opposed to everybody else. The other two guys, uh, Sokol and uh, Bethard, just being in there for one. And I think part of it, too, is just the fact that he's when they were rotating with reps because they it started out with all three of them, you know, taking every two reps. Rudock was always the first guy to go. And then when you had this scrimmage that was at Kinnick Stadium recently, he was the one that got the first work with the first unit. So that kind of implies to me there that he's probably the favorite. I don't think there's a coincidence that they've had that same pattern going over and over again. And I mean, I think Cody Sokol has a shot potentially just because the, the one thing that I feel he has is the ability to make plays, uh, you know, out of the pocket and off off schedule, which is something that Greg Davis talked about in his press conference a couple weeks ago. But I think in the end, you know, barring any sort of injuries that happen between now and that season opener against Northern Illinois, I would imagine Jake Rudock going to be the guy that that is out there with the first team offense that, that afternoon at Kinnick Stadium. All right. Quick follow up on that. You know, for people who haven't seen a lot of these quarterbacks, what's like a quick word to describe each of them to, to what separates them because it seems like when it's out there you know maybe Cody is more a little bit more athletic but I don't know I, th I think with Rudock it's mainly experience and I think just the fact too that his decision making when he's at 
when he has been out there as far as knowing when to get rid of the football, who to get it to. I think that's probably where he has the best edge right now. Whereas a guy, like I said, with Sokol, his best ability is being able to scramble out of the pocket. He, he's a guy that if they did want to run the football and if they wanted to use his own read, which I know they showed from time to time yeah, during the spring, that, that's something where I feel he might be the most effective quarterback if that ends up being a focal point of their offense uh, as the season goes on. Um, as far as CJ goes, I, I think it's just upside with him more than anything else. I think he has a little bit of both, but it's just one of those things where he might not be ready just yet because he's only going to be a redshirt freshman. It, it, it could end up being something where, you know, down the road he ends up being the best of the three quarterbacks. But yeah, yeah. right now I think it's just one of those things that it's going to take a little bit more time with him. But, uh, again, I feel like it, it could ultimately just become a two-man race, and it could end up even being something where both of those guys end up seeing snaps regardless of who ends up starting. Yeah, interesting thing is all these guys have multiple years of eligibility left, so we could see this competition going over the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, the hurry-up offense, we saw a lot of that in the spring scrimmage uh, both times that the Hawkeyes were out there. The players seem like uh, they're down with that, and Greg Davis seems like that's here to say. Kirk Ferentz had a little bit of not so fast on that. <laughs> What, what do you think, Brendan? Uh, I think they're definitely going to be using it more here mm -hmm. this this season because it's basically what they were doing. You know, you, you mentioned the, the scrimmage they had at Kinnick Stadium. Like the first, you know, two or three quarters of that, that's all they were doing was no huddle and calling plays at the line of scrimmage as opposed to, you know, lining up and doing huddles, the, the things that most Iowa fans have probably been accustomed to seeing over the years. Um, it might end up being a better offense just in the sense that they, if, if they manage to just do one thing and stick with it, if they, I feel if they continue to mix it up, it could end up being something where it, it ends up being similar to last year. But uh, I, I think it helps in the sense that they've had a year to kind of get used to everything and it probably would be more crisp now than it would have been, say, last fall. Well, I mean, everybody assumes, oh, let's run the no huddle, it'll make our offense better. You know, what are some of the negatives that could come out of it, you know, putting more stress on the defense. And I think that would be the one negative because right now, if you do look at the defense, I think it should be a better unit. But the question right now is along that defensive line in particular, who's going to step up at the uh, two DN spots. And the one thing is if you do run a no huddle and you have a quick three and out because you're not able to, you know, get a first down, like let's say it's a third and eight, they run a three or four yard pattern and they, they ends up being fourth and short and they end up punting, I mean, right there, that that's less rest for your defense. And as a result, they're going to be on the field more. And if they're already struggling as is, you know, I, I think the one game that immediately comes to mind there is the Indiana game last year uh, where the, the offense had issues. And it reached a point where the defense is out there long enough. They just kept getting carved apart. Another game that I think about, too, is Central Michigan back in uh, last September when they ended up losing. That was a game where they, I believe the Chippewas had 36 minutes time of possession. Yeah. You can't, if your defense is struggling, you can't afford to put them in that sort of spot. Whereas, you know, if the offense, the key for them is being just being able to pick up first downs, which is something they really struggled with and being able to convert on third downs. If they can do that, they're going to be a better team as a whole. But if they can't do that and you see the defense getting gassed, you know, it could be something where they end up losing close games like they were a year ago. Interesting to see you know, if the Hawkeyes are going to be able to bounce back from that 4-8 season. Those are a couple things that we'll definitely have to watch out, watch for this upcoming year. Brendan, we really want to thank you for joining us. That's all the time we have on Iowa Sports Talk for today. For Matt Jansen, I'm Kyle Hughes. We want to thank our guests, Brendan Stiles and Melson Basabi. Thanks for watching.